Sensei, Chiba Sensei talked about four pillars of the training system. Uh, Aikido body art, uh, weapons training, Zazen, and Iaido. Um, so these four elements taken together in his mind were a way that Westerners or non-Japanese could uh, properly grasp uh, what was going on in Aikido and what O Sensei was trying to present. Um, so if you just do Aikido body art, you won't have the information that you would get from training with weapons. If you only do weapons, you wouldn't understand um, some of the spiritual aspect that, or, or the emotional or um, mind aspect that you might get from meditation. Um, and then Iaido he introduced because I think it, it um, gives you a very specific instruction and a very specific feel for the Japanese sword. Uh, even a little bit beyond you can get with Boken. Um, so, you know, knowing that, uh, feel, I believe he felt that uh, because Aikido was so, uh, so much a part of Japanese culture, both the martial culture and the spiritual culture, um, that without those all of those elements, it would be very difficult for a, a non-Japanese to really understand it. So that was the system he devised to try and help us to, uh, to do that. Uh, more, more specifically, um, our school puts a very large emphasis on the connection between weapons and body art. Uh, so this afternoon in the first class you saw me talk a lot about te katana and cutting. Um, and it's the, the way we use these are very, very explicitly uh, related uh, to our weapons work. And that's, uh, that was, reflects Chiba Sensei's approach to the training. He felt that weapons training was in, integral to body art training and that in fact no, there's no separation. Weapons training and body art training were the same thing. So you do both to understand, to understand the whole of the martial art. And, and Zazen as well. To him, they were all one, one practice, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, he, he came up in a very, he, he, had, he was very passionate about Aikido training. And he would often tell the story about you know, when, when he was growing up, he, uh, when he came up and started martial arts training, he did karate and he did judo. And one day by chance, he was in a bookstore and he saw a book um, written by uh, Nidai Doshu, Kishomaru Ueshiba, that had O Sensei's picture on the back. And he saw O Sensei's picture and he, in his mind, he knew right away, that's my teacher. So right away, he went to Hombu Dojo, just from seeing O Sensei's picture in this book. And he sat outside Hombu Dojo for three days, and the Uchideshi and uh, you know, uh, the other people were looking like, who is this guy sitting outside? And they said, well, this, he wants to come in and train. And they were like, well, he can't come train. We, who is, we don't know him. So he just stayed there. And then finally, after three days, O Sensei came back from Iwama and came in and said, who's this guy sitting out in the front? And they said, we don't know, but he's been there for three days. And O Sensei said, fine, let him in. But this, was, this, was, this is Sensei's um, passion and, um, and focus uh, and, and love. And then later on in his life, toward the end of his life, he talked about um, his love for Aikido as a, as a romantic pursuit. Uh, Aikido, was a, uh, Aikido was a princess, and he was a guard at the castle who had devoted his life to protecting her, even though he would never really know her, as, is literally how he described it. Um, so th this, was, this was kind of who he was and, and very fierce and very focused and demanded a lot of people that wanted to do the training. Um, and, and it suffered a lot, you know, after the war, as Mauricio said, after the war, you know, they had nothing but brown rice and, and sweet potatoes to eat and things, you know, so that back in those days, any of the Uchideshi from that time, uh, Yamada Sensei, Kanai Sensei, uh, Kurita Sensei, they'll all tell you that there was no food, it was cold. They trained all the time. Nobody told them how to do anything. So they were just getting beaten up and starving. <laughs> uh, and, and Sensei talked a lot about how difficult it was to take care of O Sensei as well. So he did very severe training. And then somehow he managed to come to the United States and obviously we couldn't do training as severe as he did, but it was, he, he tried to bring as much of it as he could uh, without driving everybody away, I think. <laughs> so, And I think... Um, 
again, because of some of the cultural aspects, um, taking that model from the Oeshiba family or that Japanese model of an apprenticeship and trying to apply it to a dojo in the West is not, it'd be very difficult. Uh, I have some colleagues who are doing similar things, but even they have to modify it a bit because it's just a, it's a slightly different context and a different time. Um, so it probably doesn't make sense. Uh, but at the same time, I think we want to keep some aspects of it. Uh, some of the, you know, we don't want to lose certainly the aspects of shogyo and, uh, you know, um, you know, when Kenshi Sei and Uchideshi teacher trainees need to set aside at some point their own desires and their own agenda and, and focus fully on what their teacher's trying to present. Uh, but I, I don't think it can look the same as it did for them. It's just not, it's not the same time or place. Uh, so there's this expression in Japanese, devil's hands, Buddha's heart. And that was, that was his ideal. And he very much had devil's hands. But very, very powerful, uh, could be very, um, very sharp, very critical, uh, very physical, um, and uh, stressful. <laughs> you know, and, and again, I wasn't, one of, I, I wasn't one of his uchideshi because I saw what happened to his uchideshi. And I said, no, I don't think I need to get that close to the fire. Uh, I'm warm enough back here, you know. <laughs> but many of my good friends uh, trained with him for many years and uh, suffered a lot um, in, in the right, I think mostly in the right kind of way. But it was very severe, uh, training with him was very severe shugyo for who did it. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of characterized the whole organization. I started in 1989 when I was in university. And it's, it's a constant experiment. You know, if I interact with this person, what happens? If I'm feeling a certain way this day, how does that affect my Aikido? Uh, you know, some days it's boring, some days I don't want to do it anymore. But, but mostly, uh, <laughs> you know, honestly, after 30 years of anything, you get uh, Ikkyo again. Huh? But then someday something happens and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's different. Um, so there's always, you know, something new to uncover. Um, and it just reminds you that you're never quite done. Um, so I think apart from the physical aspects of it, which I think are very important, there's that sort of keeping yourself in check. Because I think actually in, in the context of training, uh, serious training, uh, it's, uh, it can be fun, it, absolutely it can be fun, but I think the bigger deal is, um, and often in the context of the most uh, difficult training, uh, rather than fun, what you get is joy. And it usually comes when you don't expect it. Usually when you're most depressed, most tired, most feeling beat up, suddenly out of nowhere, uh, a spirit or a feeling comes over you. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, as I think about what I'm saying, I'm thinking half a dozen times in my life. Um, but they're important, they're, they're a big enough deal and they give you a, 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 enough of a feeling that they help you carry on. Uh, or maybe one cut or one interaction with somebody and they say, oh, that was something. And then you're hungry to find that again. And the only way to find it again is to keep going and, and do it again, you know, keep training. <laughs> Great. Oh, thank you for not making me sit Caesar any longer. <laughs>